welcome once again, and I thank you for coming and spending this time with, with uh, together here in the study of God's Word. Let's begin with prayer as we ask God's blessing as we open the Scriptures. Father in heaven, once again we thank you for your love in providing such powerful information in the Word of God that will sustain us, that will guide us, and that will provide the tools we need to be victorious in this life and effective witnesses to others. Bless us as we study tonight and send your Holy Spirit to be present. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're talking about the prophetic secrets of the New World Order. And we've already learned quite a bit. Now, let's just quickly review those principles that the globalists use to establish and maintain the New World Order. Number one is cities. Thank you. Number two is common language. Number three is security. That's right. They're very concerned about security. Uh, number four is climate change. That's right. Number five is war. I heard it. Somebody said war. War. They are always preparing for the next war. Um, the chaos provides them an opportunity to control. People want to be, um, at, 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 uh, be organized, and, and the chaos uh, makes them demand stronger measures and stronger control so that everything can come back to equilibrium again. Okay, and uh, number six is education. That's right, education. And number seven is the control of food resources. Think Monsanto. <laughs> and uh, not only Monsanto, but the legislative support for Monsanto. But today we're going to study how God used His servants in the midst of globalization to reveal His glory. I think it's very important for us to understand that God wants us to represent Him in the midst of globalization. We cannot run away from globalization. We're part of the planet. The only way you're ever going to get away from the globalization is if you're dead or you're translated. That's the only way. The only two ways that exist. And even when you die, they sometimes control where you're buried. <laughs> but in any case, God wants us to understand how to live in the midst of a globalized world. Living is more important than anything else. And God wants us to live in such a way as to reveal and reflect His glory and the beauty of His character in the midst of these great and terrible things that arise. In every crisis, God is always prepared. He always counters the actions of the enemy. Satan collaborates with world leaders to bring about globalization. God uses his angels to throw problems. You know, the angels have a lot of tools in their toolbox to hold back the winds of strife, don't they? And I watch these, I, at least I think I see them, you know, when I uh, watch global events unfold because, you know, they will, they will suddenly do something and it will slow down the plans of these men and these organizations. God counters to prevent destruction of his church. Satan, we are told, always is trying to rid the earth of witnesses for God and his truth. So God counters to prevent destruction of his church. Um, because his church is the voice of warning. The church on earth is the voice of reproof to the world. And as we mentioned in a previous uh, uh, study, that the name Seventh-day Adventist is a reproof to all those who promote Sunday observance. We should not be taking it off of the signs. We should putting, be putting it on the signs even more than it is that are outside the churches and institutions that we have today in the world. A second reason why God counters the plans and the uh, collaboration of the agencies of the enemy is to enlighten the wicked. God wants to show the wicked the truth of his character, the truth of his law. Um, even leaders. In fact, that's why he had Daniel and 
his three friends in Babylon so that they could enlighten Nebuchadnezzar and the other Chaldeans, for that matter, concerning the uh, things of God. Well, Babylon was no exception, of course. God always has his witnesses. There is always a prophetic voice. There is always a prophetic voice. What is a prophetic voice? This is the message of God in the midst of crisis, in the midst of globalization, in the midst of the new world order. God will have his prophetic voice in the last days. Okay? So, that prophetic voice um, addresses the circumstances of the emergencies that arise. When there's an emergency, God has a prophetic voice to instruct and to guide and to show you how to live in the midst of that crisis. Um, Satan's malice, of course, towards Christ plays out against God's people, you know, and so we expect crises in our times. There are reasons why God needed a prophet in Babylon. And in the midst of every experience of the New World Order, God has always had that prophetic voice. God used Babylon to punish Israel. Babylon needed enlightenment. So they got two things out of it. By sending uh, Israel into Babylon, God punished Israel. But he also used them then to enlighten the Babylonians. Babylon was wicked, and God never punishes without providing light and, and, and warning. Uh, most, the most amazing thing is that Babylon's prophet, though, was also speaking to us, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Um, establishing a prophetic anchor uh, was uh, important because then we can verify in history after the fact. And I want to point this out um, because it's very important that we understand that, that Daniel did what he did for us. He also did it for himself and for those that were there, but it was especially for us. Um, in our work, um, we, we have some health work that we do in Australia, a couple of health centers, New Start lifestyle type centers that I am involved with in Australia. And we have guests that come to us, and Australia is a very secular country, so most of these guests do not have much experience in the things of God or religion in general. In fact, most of them have had no religious training or background whatsoever. So when they come to us, they are secular and even atheist. One woman came to us, she had a number of problems, and uh, she went through the orientation, and we explained everything to her about the program, and then she said to us, well, I'm not going to come to your spiritual emphasis because that's our morning and evening worship, you know. <laughs> she said, I'm not coming to the spiritual emphasis because I don't believe in God. Okay, well, that's fine. Four days later, she came back to the manager and she said, I'm frustrated. She said, Why? She says, I am learning so much here, so much good information, she says, but I'm frustrated because there's God in everything and I don't believe in God. <laughs> the poor woman, she must have really been in some difficulty. The manager was quick on her feet. She said, well, would you like me to show you from the Bible itself proof that God exists? She wasn't quite ready for that. It was Thursday, but on Friday morning she came back and she said, okay, I'll give you one chance to show me from the Bible proof, the Bible itself, proof that God exists. Where do you think the manager took her for the study that Friday night? To Daniel, that's exactly right. Daniel chapter 2. Why? Because in Daniel chapter 2, God revealed what was going to happen in the future. And now from our time, we can look back at it and we can say, oh, that happened, that happened, that happened. It gave certainty not only to what actually happened, but it gives us certainty for the future. And it proves that there's a God that can do these things. He can predict and it will come to pass. 
No Nostradamus can do what God can do. <laughs> no soothsayer, no palm reader, no other spiritualist can do what God can do. They're always going to be wrong, at least in some way. God used Daniel to establish credibility with Nebuchadnezzar, who did not believe that Daniel's God had power. You see, God proved himself to Nebuchadnezzar, and God is still proving himself to people today. I think that's fantastic. We need a prophetic anchor. That anchor of Daniel chapter 2 really lays the foundation so that we can trust every other prophetic principle that God has given us in the Bible. In other words, what Daniel did back then now shows us that we can expect such and such and such and such to happen, and it will happen. It is an absolute certainty. No prophecy of Scripture can fail. Not one. I think that's pretty amazing. We can have confidence, confidence that God has everything under control. Well, as you know, the, the, three, the four Hebrews were ten times wiser than the Chaldeans themselves. I think that's also very important because God was trying to help those Chaldeans not only understand himself, but it was a reproof to their arrogant assumptions. You know, they were mystics of the highest order. They were spiritualists. And God reproved them. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, let's come over to Daniel chapter 2. Sorry, Daniel chapter 1 to start with. Uh, verse 20 says, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. He published this fact. It was published so that it's written in the Bible. Ten he let them know that they were ten times wiser than all the rest. He was astonished by it. Absolutely blown away. And so were these other Chaldeans, but they were, they were reproved by this. It showed their stupidity compared to the information and the knowledge and wisdom that God shared with these men. Daniel gives us the foundation for the prophetic voice in the New World Order. Nebuchadnezzar thought that Daniel was good. He was ten times better than all the rest. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand how good he really was. He would not understand that until Nebuchadnezzar had a crisis that only Daniel could solve under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do you think that in the last days there will be crises that arise that only God's people can solve? I suspect there will be. And God will need people who will stand in their place as the prophetic voice to help people understand what to expect, why these things are happening, and how to expect them to unfold. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was the final authority. All globalists think that way. <laughs> they think that they are the final authority, that a human or, or human agency is final. You know, the laws and the mandates that they put down in, in law and jurisprudence and whatever else. But God intended to show Nebuchadnezzar otherwise. And the same thing happens in, in our time or will happen as, as uh, time unfolds. Uh, God sets up kings and governments and he takes them down. So Daniel was to be the one to whom Nebuchadnezzar would go for advice. You know, God needed to show Nebuchadnezzar that he was not eternal, he was not God, and there was a higher power. And that his end would come at some point in time. And Daniel was the one not only to tell him that, but Daniel was also the one to whom he would go for advice. Do you think that God will use his people in the last days as the advisors of kings and rulers? I think so. I think there will be some people who will have to stand before rulers and legislative bodies and give their testimony of the truth of God. 
Nebuchadnezzar needed a prophet to speak. And God needed a prophet to speak to Nebuchadnezzar. And in the last days, there will be a need for a prophet or the prophetic voice, just as there was in Daniel's time. So, now that Daniel is ten times more wise than all the other Chaldeans, uh, now he was in position. God gave him favor with Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar gave him a high position in the government. That put him in, in, in place for the next unfolding drama. And so after a little while, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream. I think that dream is very important. We read it in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, a dream, dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. He dreamed dreams and his spirit was trouble, troubled. Why was the spirit troubled? Well, he couldn't remember what the dream was for one thing, but when he saw that dream, there was something in the dream that was ominous and made him fearful. He was troubled in his spirit. So in the early morning, he summons all of the leaders, all the Chaldeans to the palace. The city is still asleep, mostly. What's this all about, they ask. And Nebuchadnezzar explains his problem. The Chaldeans ask him for the dream, verse 4. Then spake the Chaldeans unto the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation. Well, that would be pretty easy to do. You know, you think, you know if, he, if they knew the dream, they could certainly come up with some kind of an explanation. At least that's what they thought. I mean, after all, they're the wise men and the astrologers. They're the diviners, the ones who practice divination in the kingdom. They would know for certainly how, how to, uh, or for certain how to understand or interpret that dream. The problem was that Nebuchadnezzar could not, of course, remember his dream. And, there were, and then, of course, the, the discussion went on. They said, but if you show the dream, verse 6, he, he demanded of them, if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. And they answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. And the king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye would gain time. He began to distrust them. Because ye see the thing is gone from me. And so he threatens them and says, If you will not make known to me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I'll know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Wow! What a demand! Here are these Chaldeans, Chaldeans standing there in astonishment that their lives are on the line and they can do nothing. They cannot reveal the dream. They don't know what dream Nebuchadnezzar had. Imagine how they must have felt. The big question in my mind is why wasn't Daniel there? We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to show you one more thing from this. It's very interesting. This verse here says in verse uh, 11, they said, It is a rare thing that the king requireth. Do you think there are going to be rare things that will be required in the last days? <clears throat> and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. I think that's extremely interesting and very important because the gods of these astrologers did not dwell with flesh, but the God of heaven, he dwells with flesh. Isn't that wonderful? God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. 
And when God speaks through a prophet, it's as if he is there speaking. He dwells with his people through the agency of his prophet. God was about to show Nebuchadnezzar that he does dwell with flesh and that these Chaldeans can be shamed for their lack of understanding and knowledge. Nebuchadnezzar demonstrates his temper, you know, and he sends a decree, verse 13. Uh, the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So why wasn't Daniel among the Chaldeans? Daniel was too young and inexperienced. He just finished high school. Well, not high school, but the king's school. And he didn't have the experience of years of working with these things like these other Chaldeans. They figured he couldn't offer much to King Nebuchadnezzar, so they didn't bother to call him. And besides, this was too important of a problem to trust into the hands of a foreigner. After all, these were captives. You see, globalists don't normally turn to God. Not, not when they need answers. They, they turn to themselves and others like them. They have councils. In Europe, there's the, 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 they're all globalists, of course. There's the European Parliament. There's the European Council and the European Commission. Three! Three councils of lots of people in order to globalize over in Europe. They don't turn to God for answers. They turn to themselves. They turn to their own ideas. They ignore those who follow God when making New World Order decisions. They view Christians as a nuisance and as irrelevant. They only collaborate out of political ne necessity if they have to, such as with the Vatican. You know, they, they, they are interested in, in working with, with themselves, not with God. So they're not going to come and ask you for advice. God has to put you there and create circumstances like Daniel that put him in that spot. So Daniel was absent. Arioch. Now I like this interesting fellow, Arioch. Verse 15, he answered and said unto Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known unto Daniel. Daniel did not know what was going on. And by this time, Arioch knew Daniel fairly well. They may have been friends even. Verse 3, or rather, ver, verse um, uh, 16 says that Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time. Uh, actually, I wanted to point out verse 14. It says, Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch. That's important. What is counsel and wisdom? Where did Daniel get his counsel and wisdom from? God gave him this wisdom. And so he answered with, with prudence. He answered gently. Why is this thing so urgent? So Arioch gave him leave to go to the king, and the king, uh, he requested the king that he would show the king the uh, time, that he would show the king the interpretation. The king, of course, thought this was important. After all, here is someone who didn't have the chance to, you know, discuss this before. And maybe he could answer. And uh, the hope of getting an answer no doubt gave the king uh, the impression to grant his request. But I want you to notice verse 17. Whenever there's a crisis, Daniel goes to his knees in prayer. Look at verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. This is not an idle statement. When you read the scriptures, my friends, you must not just read it idly. Don't put your brain in neutral. When you read the Bible, put it in gear. This is important because Daniel's friends and companions were his prayer partners. They were his colleagues. They were the ones that he could open his heart to 
at the human level. He opened his heart to God, of course. But, you know, you need somebody to share the intimate things of your life. And Daniel's three friends were those companions that he could rely on to be there for him and with him in these times of difficulty and trial. So they had a prayer meeting. And I think it's important to understand what kind of prayer meeting they had. This was an earnest, fervent prayer meeting. It was a life and death issue. So you can be sure that their prayers were sincere and earnest and they cast themselves on the mercies of God. That's what it says in verse 17 and 18. Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to his friends, his companions, verse 18, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. This is not just a story, my friends. You must also have a prayer life like Daniel. If you're going to be able to navigate the unique and difficult circumstances that you and I will face in the last days, you must have a prayer life like Daniel and his friends. You see, no doubt Daniel realized that this was a crisis of opportunity. When God brings a crisis in your life, my friends, do you see it as an opportunity? I usually complain. <laughs> At least that's my nature. Why is this happening to me? What have I done that's so bad, you know? But God provides a crisis because it's an opportunity to grow. We need to be able to grow. And so God needs to push us in order to bring us to our knees so that we can rely on Him. Daniel and his friends fell on their knees and in confidence in God, they spoke with Him and asked Him for His mercies to reveal the thing to them. Um, Daniel's friends were his companions. They, he was familiar with them. And they could pray together in a prayer meeting that was very bonding. Bo prayer partners are very good friends. You know, they become very good friends usually, prayer partners. So friends, if you don't have a prayer partner, find one and start praying together and watch what God does. Get ready. Buckle your seatbelt. Things are going to start happening. If you have a good, solid prayer life, and you throw yourself on the mercies of God, God is going to change your life. It's going to make an amazing difference. It's something that you need and I need it. Amen? Amen? All right. So Daniel, after they had their prayer, what did Daniel do? He went to bed. Well, at least we're not... Actually, the Bible doesn't tell us that he went to bed. And perhaps we should be careful with this because... Um, the Bible just says then the, thing, the secret was revealed unto Daniel. Some people think uh, that he received a vision at that point in time. Historically, or traditionally at least, we think that perhaps he was sleeping. Anyway, whatever it was, he was at peace. Daniel was at peace in face of death because he had confidence in God. I think that's something that I have to develop. Do you have to develop peace in the midst of chaos and crisis? <laughs> That's really important. Anyway, he had peaceful heart as God reveals to him this dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He blesses God in his... Daniel does not neglect to thank God for giving him uh, the secret. It says in verse 19, Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. Do you, do you have that kind of blessing in your heart for God every morning when you wake up? We should, you know. We need to practice blessing God, don't we? Daniel blessed God forever and ever, he said, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in 
the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Daniel does not neglect to th thank God. And what a prayer of thanks it is. Friends, when God answers your prayer so dramatically, do you thank God? Do you remember to thank Him? Often we pray and go on and God answers our prayer, but we forget to thank Him. I have started to practice this in my own life and I am not entirely successful yet. But um, every night when my wife and I go to bed, we have prayer together and we thank God for what He has done for us throughout the day. We bless Him because He has sustained us, He has given us success, or whatever has happened in our lives, we want God to know that we appreciate it. Well, of course, in verse 24, we realize He goes to Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. I like Arioch, even though he's a little bit selfish. <laughs> Verse 25 says, He brought Daniel in before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found a man among the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. I have found a man. Really? I tell you, my friends, God found a man. It wasn't Arioch. God found him. And when God moves, he finds the right people for the right spot in the right place with the right words at the right time. I don't know about you, my friends, but that's my experience with God. God always has somebody at the right place at the right time. I've seen it over and over again in my experience. Anyway, Arioch takes him into the king, takes a little bit of credit for himself, hoping to pay, maybe get a raise, Nebuchadnezzar glories in the fact that, or the thought, that his God is more powerful than Daniel's God, than any other God of any other society that he has conquered. He is arrogant. He stands above them all. But now he has to listen to what the God of Judah has to say. In the past, he didn't pay attention to these other gods. He just reveled in the fact that his God was more powerful. Now he has to pay attention to what another God has to say. The God of Judah. Notice what he says to Daniel. The king answered, verse 26, whose name, uh, said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Now this is Daniel's opportunity. And friends, whenever you are faced with this issue in the New World Order, you must always give glory to God and never take credit for yourself. Always give the glory to God. Daniel told the king that it was not in him. But first he told the king something else. Verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Why does he name all these people? He's trying to embarrass them. He is embarrassing them before the king so that the king will not trust them. What the king is about to find out is that all that divination that these Chaldeans would bring to the palace was worthless and stands as nothing against even one man with divine inspiration. Oh, brothers and sisters, what a powerful God we serve. So Daniel <coughs> goes on. The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, magicians, and soothsayers show unto the king. They can't do it. They are helpless. 
He reminds the king that they are absolutely incapable, even though they are the wisest men of the kingdom, except for, of course, the four of the Hebrews. But then he says in verse 28, but there is a God in heaven. Friends, whenever you come to a crisis, what should you say? There is a God in heaven. Aren't you thankful that there's a God in heaven? God, a God in heaven that pays attention to your problems. A God in heaven who loves you no matter what your background, no matter what your circumstances. The God of heaven or the God in heaven who reaches down into your life and into your little world and solves problems, opens up opportunities, prepares the road before you. There is, my friends, a God in heaven. And oh, how grateful we can be because of that. He said, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. The whole Bible is revealing secrets, isn't it? And maketh known King to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. When? The latter days. It's not only just in his own time, but right on down, right down to our own time in the latter days. When that rock is cut out of the mountain and comes and crushes the, the kingdoms before it. They dream thy dream, rather, and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And he went on to describe. You see, he's helping Nebuchadnezzar build confidence in the God of heaven. That's very important. Because Nebuchadnezzar didn't have any confidence in the God of heaven. But Nebuchadnezzar's mind is about to change very quickly. Um... He keeps on giving credit to God as if to emphasize it. Even verse 29, he says it again. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. God reveals secrets. And so he keeps on repeating this and emphasizing this so that Nebuchadnezzar will only think to come to Daniel and Daniel's God when he has a question or a problem or a secret, a solution. You see, the, the Babylonians gloried in all of this, these riddles and the secrets. This was one of their big things. And here was a riddle. Here was a secret that they could not understand. And only the God of heaven could reveal it to him. And I want you to notice verse 30. He stops in the middle of telling him the dream to, as if to keep the suspense going. Verse 30, he said, As for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. I don't have any more wisdom than those Chaldeans. But for their sakes, the Chaldeans... Certainly, because they're going to survive. The death penalty is relieved. Okay? He saves their lives. He says, for their sakes, that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thine heart. It's Daniel's it, it just, it's stretching this out. <laughs> he keeps on stretching it out, and Nebuchadnezzar's getting more interested all the time. You see, God has strategies. He wants to lock it in. When somebody is interested in the things of God, God wants to nail it down so that he stays there once he's accepted the truth. I don't know why, but when some people come and accept the truth of God in the last days here, they get baptized and they come into the church and then a few weeks later they depart, never to come back again. And you think the truth, there's so much truth that they have just walked out on. Yes, perhaps there are those who offend them. I don't know. God forbid that any of us should offend anyone. There might be other reasons why they leave. Maybe they got discouraged by relatives. Friends, we got to stay close to these people. You can't just drop them. When they come in, you can't just drop them. You got to stay with them, work with them, keep encouraging them, bring them into your fellowship. 
and into your um, more intimate gatherings and so on, so that they will not lose their faith and lose their experience with Christ. Daniel reveals the details of the dream in verse 31 through 36. And he describes this image. And as Daniel describes the image, Nebuchadnezzar begins to realize that this is what he saw. It all comes back to him. Verse 36 says, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Notice the word, we. Daniel does not forget his friends. That's one thing. But Daniel also is saying that he and God will reveal. Together, they're working together. You know, when we do our work for God, it is a collaboration. The human and the divine, they work together. So when we have a prophetic voice in the last days, which of course involves the message of Daniel, it involves the message of Revelation, it involves the whole Bible really. So as the prophetic voice rises in the last days in the new world order, there is a we that's involved. We together as companions in God's work and we with God work together to reveal the secrets of the prophecy that God has established. The king is gobsmacked. He recognizes and acknowledges Daniel. And ex as Daniel explains the dream, and um, we're not going to read all the dream, you know it very well, but uh, Daniel is the most credible person now in the whole kingdom. He's the most credible person in the whole kingdom. Nobody stands above Daniel. God organized this so that the prophetic voice would have more credibility than any other voice out there. No voice of divination is going to be anything like that of Daniel. He's so far ahead of all the others that when any problem comes up, Daniel is the one that is consulted. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just put Daniel in the position uh, of honor that he's in just because, you know, he was, he was emotionally wrought up. Oh, no. He saw that he needed Daniel in that role. He needed Daniel to guide him and give him understanding and, and wisdom along the way. He needed Daniel far more than he needed those diviners. And he worshipped Daniel, the Bible says. Uh, in, uh, let's see, it's in verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. And the king answered Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Does your God answer secrets or reveal secrets? You see, friends, as we look at the new world order today, there are things going on behind the scenes that most people don't understand. But if you have the eye of prophecy, it begins to unfold before you. And God will lay it out. We're going to be doing some of that over the next few sessions together. We're going to talk about some very current and relevant developments that are to many people secrets that they cannot comprehend. And they are blind, as it were. They don't understand. They may even, they may even rant and rail about certain things that they don't like. You know, there's certain radio and internet um, voices out there that, that go on about all kinds of conspiracies and things that are going on in the world. But they cannot understand it truly because they don't understand the Bible and they don't understand prophecy. The prophetic voice in the New World Order doesn't just reveal the things about uh, the, 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 the details of, of uh, the last days, but it also reveals the underlying issues of how and why. 
How are these things happening and why are they happening? I'll give you an example. Right after 9-11, there was a very interesting executive order that was issued by President Bush. It was to freeze the assets of the terrorists. Does that, you remember that? He, f he, he issued an executive order and he said, if, the ter if there's going to be a terrorist organization, it is going to be blocked. It will not be able to do business in the United States or with any of our allies or any banks or any, any other organizations. In other words, by freezing the assets, he was saying that they would not be able to buy or sell. Now, these are religious extremists. And perhaps that's the right thing to do. But it also revealed to me something. And all of a sudden the penny dropped and I realized for all these years I've been thinking, how is it ever going to be that in the land of the free we're going to have Sunday laws? How is it that America is going to overthrow and repudiate its constitution? That was always on my mind. I'm trying to figure this out. I've been watching it for years. Even as a young man I was watching these things with great interest. But I tell you, at 9-11, the penny finally dropped and I began to understand how it was going to happen. And I watched a whole series of things, and you probably did too. A whole series of things that basically resurrected the Inquisition of the Middle Ages in principle. Not only for foreign terrorists and fighters, but for U.S. citizens as well. And I found that to be very, very helpful to begin to understand these things. And as time has gone on, um, more and more has come to light. And it's amazing how much you begin to see behind the scenes once you know prophecy, once you understand the trajectory of, Bible, of the Bible and its principles, its prophetic principles. Once you understand that, then all of it becomes clear. You know, why do they do this and why do they do that? What's behind this and how does this happen? It all comes clear when you pay attention to prophecy in relation to current events. You see, my friends, <clears throat> we must learn to develop a prophetic mentality. And I believe the Bible is prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. There are other things in the Bible besides prophecy, but in every book of the Bible you have some prophecy, and in many places uh, there is more than one prophecy, many of them in fact. But there is a prophetic mentality that we must develop. Otherwise, things will happen and go right over our heads. We'll miss the significance of the things that people do and say that has prophetic application to our times. The prophetic mindset, friends, is there's basically four or five points in order to develop a prophetic mindset. Number one, you must develop a working knowledge of Scripture. What is a working knowledge? Well, that means that you work with it all the time. In other words, you're paying attention to it all the time and you're listening to what the Bible says and you're also connecting it with what's going on around you. You're applying it in a personal way. A working knowledge of Scripture is a personal application, okay? You need a working knowledge of Scripture to develop a prophetic mindset, to, prevent, to develop the prophetic voice in your own life you need a working knowledge of Scripture. You also need a working knowledge of the spirit of prophecy. Amen. A practical application to your own life. And friends, if you don't take what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy says and put it in your own life in a practical way, it will stop coming. The prophetic voice will stop coming. But if you surrender to it, it will expand and grow and develop so that you become mature in Christ. And you have a mature outlook on the world around you. You see, a prophetic mindset is a prophetic mentality. And a mentality is especially important because it's how you look at things around you. That's what a mentality is, isn't it? Do you have a mentality? Do you have a mentality? 
Of course you do. I have a mentality. <coughs> I've had to develop a mentality, a prophetic mentality. We need a prophetic mentality because that will influence the way we see things around us and it will make you a powerful witness to people around you that don't understand things the way you do from the Bible. I was once on an airplane. Sitting next to me was a professor, a professor of history, Riverside University. We were flying from Ontario to Denver. And since I teach history, we had something to talk about. We talked shop. All the way to Denver, two hours. And I said to, I asked him questions and he told me that he was really an agnostic. He said his father was a Roman Catholic. His mother was a Jew. And he was in his 70s at the time. And he said, back when I was a teenager, he said, you can understand, back then there was, so, there, there was as much religious animosity between religions as there was racial animosity. And uh, he said, you can understand that when I wanted to date a Jewish girl, I would always talk about my mother and I would never talk about my father. <laughs> and he said, when I wanted to date a Catholic girl, I would always talk about my father, but I would never talk about my mother. <laughs> he said, I learned to prevaricate. What's that? Lie. Lie. He said, I learned to prevaricate. And he said, I was very good at it. I didn't ask him, I probably should have, how did he... What, what did he do when he wanted to date a Protestant girl? <laughs> but we, we got on to other things. This was right after 9-11. And uh, we got to talking about that. And, and um, I was asking him lots of questions about what he thought about the circumstances and the things that were unfolding. I knew that if I kept asking him questions, what do you think he would do? He would turn around and ask me questions. That's right. And that's what I wanted. You see, friends, you can talk to people. As I think I told you the other night, you can talk to people. Just start talk, asking questions. Inevitably, they'll turn around and ask the same questions back at you. So I asked him question after question. And finally, he turned to me. I was praying, asking God to show me a way, a way into his mind because here is a history professor who's way above me in terms of his erudite degrees and all these letters behind his name. And he's an intellectual. His name is Carlos, by the way. So I prayed and finally he turned to me and he says, what do you see coming in the future? It was golden, all right. Golden opportunity. I, and, and I immediately thanked the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you for letting me into his mind. And then I explained to him, I said, well, here's what I see. We're talking about the laws, that, the executive orders and different things that were coming in. And I said, here's what I see. These things will lead to persecution of those who don't go along and he admitted, he said, there are, there are laws that are formed and then they expand over time and people get caught in them that, that were not intended in the first place. So I used that and I said to him, look, historically there's always been persecution against those who follow God. He said, yes, that's true. I said, let me give you some examples. I said, no matter what, what Catholic or Protestant historians will tell you, those people who were persecuted in the early church were Sabbath keepers. Now, he knew about Sabbath keeping because his mother was a Jew, right? All right, so I said, look, Sabbath keepers. I said, let's come down to the Middle Ages. I said, the Waldenses. Did you ever hear about the Waldenses and the Albigenses who were persecuted by the 
the Roman Catholic Church? He said, yes. He knew about the being a history teacher. He ought to. I just assumed it anyway. But he agreed. I said, many of them were Sabbath keepers. Really? He said, yeah. I said, that's right. And then I said, well, let's come to more modern times. I said, who was it that Hitler persecuted the most? He said, the Jews, like you. I turned right around back at him. And I said, Sabbath keepers. He said, wow. He said, that's insightful. He'd never thought about that before. I'm just a little guy. You know, he's got all this background and history and everything. He's so much more intelligent than I am in certain things. How could I teach him anything? Friends, it's because the Spirit of God put the mentality in the mind. It's the prophetic mentality. And he listened to what I had to say. And when he got done, or when we got done, we landed in, in, in Denver. I said, look, I'm going to send you a book. He said, what is it? I said, it's a history book. I said, it's the best history book outside of the Bible. I said, it's the best history book you'll ever read. He said, really? What is it? I said, great controversy. Have you ever heard of it? He said, no. I said to him, I said, you live in Riverside among all those Seventh-day Adventists, and you have never heard of the book Great Controversy? He said, no, I've never heard of it. <laughs> so, in the end, he said, please send it to me. Well, just to make a sh long story short, two weeks later, I was back in Ontario. And on the plane that day, I was sitting right next to him again. <laughs> I said to the Lord, show me a way into his heart this time. Thank you for showing me a way into his mind. You know, God did that. With tears in his eyes, he told me about his experience. And I watched God work on that man. He said, I'll, I haven't got the book yet, he said, but I'll read it when I get it. I'll read every bit of it. Friends, you can talk to people. You are the prophetic voice. God wants to use you in the last days to reach hearts. And he'll do that through prophecy. If you talk to people, they'll open right up. They want to hear. They want to know. They might object to a Bible study, but if you make friends with them, you can talk to them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the prophetic voice. Thank you that in the last days you have raised up a prophetic voice once again, not only through your prophet Ellen White, but also through your people whom you have commissioned to use that information to reach others. Father in heaven, I pray that you will make us your people with a prophetic mindset that can reach hearts through the agency of the Holy Spirit that dwells in the heart of flesh. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.